Okay, so today we're going to be looking at an application of some of the things we've been learning. And that application is amplitude modulation radio. Most people call it AM, AM radio. Okay, so the two you know types of radio that you have in your car are AM radio and FM radio. FM stands for frequency modulation. Okay, so we're not going to talk about frequency modulation in this class, uh, but we are going to talk about amplitude modulation right now. And I think these days amplitude modulation is used mostly for transmitting human speech. Okay, so we're going to kind of take that as an example going through today. Okay, uh, so we're going to learn all about AM radio today. And let me just give you some real life facts. So in the US, the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that is licensed to AM radio specifically is 540 kilohertz, about this, to 1700 kilohertz. Okay, so of all of the different frequencies in the electromagnetic spectrum, this range is licensed to AM radio and it's further divided. This region is divided into 10 kilohertz chunks. for each radio station. Okay, so if we have kind of our spectrum here, which I'm going to label for now as F, because we're dealing with uh, not angular frequencies in this, in this example for real life, right? We have kilohertz, <coughs> not radians per second, cycles per second, hertz. Uh, when we go through all of the math after this little intro section, I'm going to switch back to radians per second, so I'll label it with omega. But for now, we'll just look at frequency in hertz. Okay, so we have 540 kilohertz down here. Up here, we have 1700 kilohertz. <coughs> and then maybe there's this one little radio station right there that gets 10 kilohertz. Okay, so we split this whole thing up into a bunch of different chunks for each radio station, okay? And this one station, let me just blow this up a little bit. Let's blow this up into here. So I'll call this my one station. Of course, at different parts of the country, you can reuse these, these chunks because AM radio, it's not gonna transmit across the entire country. It's in a local range. So if you're in one state or you know, across the country in some other state, obviously you'll reuse these chunks of the spectrum. I'm just talking right now about, let's say we're in one location. Okay, they're gonna split up all of these chunks or they're gonna split up the spectrum into these 10 kilohertz chunks and give one little section to each radio station. Okay, so this is our 10 kilohertz that we get to use to transmit. And then right in the middle is going to be what's called the carrier frequency. Okay, so this frequency is going to be important to us. And for instance, you know, just as an example, maybe that carrier frequency is 740 kilohertz. And this is the frequency that you would tune to in your car. So maybe you have a seek button or a dial or something, uh, and you want to listen to AM radio station 740. Uh, that's specifying the carrier frequency, kind of the center of this little frequency band over which the station can transmit. Okay, so this is kind of the setup. Uh, at least what, what it's like in uh, the real world, all right? And what we want to do is we want to transmit something. So I'm going to let X1 of T, I'll call it X1 because we're going to have other radio stations eventually. But X1 of T is going to be a baseband, a baseband signal, okay? And for example, all I mean by that is that it's kind of in the uh, lower frequency range, kind of the baseband as it's sometimes called. And this is, you know, speech, music, anything that humans can hear. And it's kind of the baseband, the lower frequencies relative to these very high frequencies, right? 400, 540 kilohertz is extremely high frequency. Okay, so relative to that, the baseband signal, things that humans can hear are going to be much, much lower frequency. So that's all I mean. So for instance, throughout this whole uh, discussion, we can just uh, treat it as speech or some ordinary 
signal, say from a microphone. Okay, so what exit one of T be a baseband signal that we want to transmit. So this is what we want to send from our radio station. Okay, so you can just think of it as speech, say, okay, someone talking. Okay, and we're going to suppose that X1 of T is band limited. We know what that means. Band limited, and it's Fourier transform is, and just so that I have something to draw, I'm going to go back to our favorite triangle. Okay, so I'm just going to pretend that this is what the Fourier transform of x1 of t looks like. And it's going to go from negative omega sub m to omega sub m. And we'll just say it has height 1. So this is just an example, just so that we can have something to look at uh, throughout this video. Okay, so let's say this is what the Fourier transform of x1 of t looks like. Of course, it doesn't have to look like that. Okay, it can look like anything. Um, but we're just going to take this as an example. Okay, so that is x1 of omega. And now what we want to do is take this signal, okay, which is currently lying in sort of the base band. It's very low frequency. We're not allowed to send this through the air, right? We're only allowed to send it up here in the super high frequency range, right? This is the frequency range that I get for my one radio station. Okay, maybe if this is 740 kilohertz, then it'd be you know, 735 kilohertz to 745 kilohertz, right? A 10 kilohertz band. But the audio signal I want to send is not in that range. It's very low frequency, okay? So what can we do? We need to do something. We need to do something to X1 of T so that its Fourier transform lies inside the AM frequency range of our radio station, right? Because that's where I'm allowed to transmit. So I need to have some way of taking this baseband signal and kind of keeping the information I want from it, but at the same time, putting it into this really high frequency range that I'm given over which to transmit. Okay, and this process has a name. This is called modulation. And this is what we're going to talk about right now. Okay, so what we're going to do is construct a modulated, as it's called, a modulated signal. Okay, and how are we going to do that? Well, it turns out what you do is you just multiply it by a cosine. And we're going to multiply it by the carrier frequency. Okay, and I'm even going to call it omega sub c1. Okay, so that is our carrier frequency for our radio station. So it's in omega, it's in radians per second, so it wouldn't be 740 kilohertz, but something like that. Okay, it's our carrier frequency of our radio station, but in our discussion, we're going to use radians per second. Okay, so this signal right here is very low frequency. This is like our speech. But that carrier frequency right there is very high frequency. Okay, and I'll just say, e.g., you know, 740 kilohertz. But of course, we're in radians per second. Um, <coughs> may I'll say 2 pi times that. 2 pi times 740 uh, radians per second. Okay, something like that, really large. Hey, you know what, I don't even, I think I'll just get rid of that. Okay, it's just some high frequency carrier, uh, carrier frequency, okay, which is very high, omega sub C1. So you can think of it, again, if we're just talking about cycles per second instead of radians per second, it is this carrier frequency, okay, which maybe is 740 kilohertz, but again, we're in radians per second, so just off by 2 pi, but still, it's that high frequency, the center of the band that we're getting. All right. And I'll just write, make a note. So omega sub C1 is called the carrier frequency. Okay, that is called the carrier frequency. And that's going to kind of carry our information signal. Okay, so what does all this look like in a picture in the time domain? Well, who knows? Maybe this is my, maybe this is my 
uh, x1 of t signal in the time domain. Question is, what does y1 of t look like? What does y1 of t look like? And in order to draw that, I'm actually going to copy this because what's happening, okay, so I'm going to draw y1 of t in a second. What's happening is that I'm taking my cosine signal that's oscillating very fast, much, much faster than any of these oscillations in x1, oscillating at a very high frequency, and cosine goes from plus one to minus one, right? That's the range of a cosine function. So when I multiply it by something, some value x1 of t at a certain t value, it's just going to scale that cosine, right? If x1 of t is really small, it'll scale that cosine way down. If x1 of t is large, it'll scale cosine up. And so what you get in the end, let me kind of draw this mirror symmetric version here for a second. What you get is a cosine function oscillating very quickly that is kind of using that x1 of t signal as an envelope, right? So the cosine goes from plus one to minus one. And so when I multiply it by the x1 of t signal, it's just going to scale it <coughs> up and down. And so that is what our y1 of t looks like. And I'll kind of draw maybe in red the outline. OK, but of course, the red is not really there. That's just to remind you how we got it. OK, so that's what y1 of t looks like. So you can see that it's a completely different signal, right? The cosine function is oscillating so quickly in y1 of t. But still, maybe there's some way we can get the x1 of t information out of it right, based on looking at sort of the envelope of this y1 of t signal. Okay, so that's what's happening in time. Uh, it turns out in frequency, the story is actually much simpler. Okay, the story is much simpler. This is x1 of t times cosine of omega sub c1 of t. Okay, so let's look at what it looks like in the frequency domain. So what does y of omega look like? y1 of omega. And I'm doing all this stuff with a subscript one because eventually we're going to look at multiple radio stations. Okay. All right. So y1 of omega is going to be the Fourier transform of y1 of t, which we know is just the Fourier transform of what? Well, y1 of t is just x1 of t times cosine of omega sub c1 of t. And we've already seen what happens in the frequency domain when we multiply by a cosine, but just for review, let's do it one more time. So this is the Fourier transform of a product. Okay, so we're going to get one over two pi times the convolution of their Fourier transforms. And what is the convolution of cosine? Or sorry, what's the Fourier transform of cosine? It's just pi times two delta functions that are at plus or minus that frequency omega sub c1. Yeah. So now I can bring that pi out and I just get one half. And then when I distribute the x1 of omega convolved uh, into that sum of deltas, I'm just going to get x1 of omega convolved with each delta function. When you convolve with a shifted delta, of course, you just end up shifting your original signal. Okay, so this is what we get. So let's see what it looks like in the picture. Okay, so if this is my x sub 1 of omega, which remember at height 1, and 1 from negative omega sub m to omega sub m. OK, so if that's my x, x1 of omega, what does y1 of omega look like? Well, I'm just going to get two copies of x1 of omega shifted <coughs> by plus or minus omega sub c1. And remember, omega sub c1 is much, much larger than this omega max of my original function, okay, my original signal. And so it's going to be, I'm not even drawing this remotely to scale, but it's going to be way outside. I'll just draw it like that because I don't have much more room. Okay, so this is omega sub c1. That's taking this function and shifting it to the right by omega sub c1. And then here is shifting to the left. And now their heights are both going to be one half. Okay, and so now look at what's happened. This is our, this is like our radio station band. This is like the band we're given. And we're also given it over here. Okay, so now we've done it. We've taken our signal, okay, which was in this baseband, low frequency, and we've multiplied it by a cosine. And what happened is we 
scaled it by one half, got two copies that are now in this high frequency band we were given as our radio station. Okay, so we did it. We modulated our signal so that now we can send this and it's going to be in the band that we were allocated. Okay, so let me just summarize some of this. So Y1 of T is transmitted by, uh, I'll say like radio station number one, okay, using an antenna. Okay, so this is what gets sent. It's the radio station's responsibility to only send things in the band they were given. Okay, so they modulate it first and then they send it through the air. And of course, each radio station has its own carrier frequency, omega sub C I, I'll call it. Okay. And what happens when all these radio stations send their signals through the air? Okay. How do these radio station signals get um, combined into the air? Well, it turns out that they add. Okay. So things add in the air. So all transmitted signals from different stations, what happens in the air? They add up in the air. Okay, and so let me draw what it might look like in the frequency domain of this air signal, the signal that's in the air from all these different radio stations. Well, we know what one of the radio stations looks like. It has these triangles. Okay, this is omega sub C1, negative omega sub C1. Okay, and what about if there are other stations? Well, maybe I'll draw one of them as sort of this half circle, and then one of them as a rectangle. Okay. Maybe this is omega sub C2 and omega sub C3. Maybe those are two other radio stations. And so on the other side, it's going to look the same negative omega sub C3, negative omega sub C2. Okay, and they all have height one half. Okay, so radio station two sent a signal that originally looked something like this, height one from negative omega max to omega max. Okay, radio station three sent something that originally looked like this. Okay, and then we did the same process as we did with our radio station. Okay, we multiplied by cosine of omega sub C two or three T. And then we got two copies of that original baseband Fourier transform uh, multiplied by a half and shifted plus, plus or minus um, the carrier frequency. Okay, so this is what everything we've done now. This is why I was using one the whole time. Now we've added two more radio stations. Okay, and this is the sum of multiple radio stations in the air. Yeah, that's what that Z of omega is. So let me just make a note. So omega sub C1, omega sub C2, and omega sub C3 are carrier frequencies. Of course, there are way more <laughs> than just three channels, but I think three is enough for us. I don't want to draw a million, a million stations here. So we're just going to pretend there are three. Um, so these are carrier frequencies of three different stations that sent signals that uh, wanted, I'll say wanted to send baseband signals x1 of t, x2 of t, and x3 of t. Okay, so the way they did that, again, they multiplied by cosine of their respective carrier frequency times t. And then they ended up with this picture in the air. Okay, so now the big question, right? If this is all in the air and we are in our car trying to listen, say, to station one, how can we obtain X1 of T out of the air, right? All this stuff is combined together. It's all added together. I have this big complicated signal. How can I extract the one radio station that I want to listen to from this big mess? Okay, so how can we obtain x1 of t from the signal in the air, z of t. This is the signal in the air. 
right? So how does your car do that? How does it pick out that one radio station for you to listen to? And this process is called demodulation. Okay, going from a modulated signal back down to a baseband signal is called demodulation. Okay, so that's what we want to do. We want to go from this big sum of modulated signals and extract from that somehow through some process our one baseband signal we want to listen to. So we want to get back to X1 of T. So we want to really get back to X1 of omega and then we'll just take an inverse Fourier transform. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to let the signal R of T kind of like receive what we're going to receive, okay, after this demodulation. Well, it's not really what we receive. We receive the thing in the air, Z of T. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just call it R of T. Um, well, it's sort of like what we're going to manipulate this receive signal to be. But anyway, so we're going to take Z of T from the air. And what are we going to do? Well, it's actually very simple. We're just going to multiply it by cosine of omega sub C1 of T. Okay, so you might be saying, wait a second, isn't this exactly what we did to modulate? Yeah, it is. Okay, it's the exact same thing. In modulation, we multiplied by cosine of omega sub C1 of T. And now in demodulation, we're going to do the same thing. Okay, but we got to understand why this actually works. How can this possibly allow us to um, be able to recover X1 of T? <coughs> okay, and so what we're going to do is look at this in the frequency domain. Then R of omega... All right, I'm going to skip some steps here because it's exactly what we did before, right? When you multiply by a cosine, you end up with one half times the Fourier transform of the thing multiplying the cosine shifted to plus or minus the frequency of the cosine. Okay, so I'm just going to do those steps one more time. So we get one half now z of omega minus omega sub c1 plus z of omega plus omega sub c1. Okay, so let's look at what this looks, looks like. In pictures. So I'm going to draw it a little smaller because I'm going to need some room here. So this is my z of omega right here. Remember we had these, we had square, circle, triangle, the so square, circle, triangle. Okay. Square, circle, triangle, something like that. And triangle, circle, square. Okay, that's what z of omega was. And these all had height one half. These all at height one half. Um, and this is zero, and this is omega sub c one, and this is negative omega sub c one. Okay, and now I want to draw r of omega. So I'm going to do it in steps. I'm going to consider each of those terms. So let's first consider what one half z of omega minus omega sub c one would look like. All that is, is taking this signal, shifting it to the right by omega sub C1 and multiplying by a half. So this point at negative omega sub C1, when I shift it by omega sub C1, will end up at zero. So I get a triangle, circle, square. And this will end up all the way over at two omega sub C1. Triangle, circle, square. Okay, and these all have height one fourth now. Right, because it started with a half and I multiply by another half. So they all have height one fourth. That's going to be important. Okay, next step. We're going to have one half z of omega plus omega sub c1. We're going to do this term. So now I'm just taking this and shifting it to the left by omega sub c1. So this point to the left will be right at the origin. And I'm going to have circle square. And then over here, so this is like negative omega sub C1, and then we're going to have negative 2 omega sub C1, triangle, circle, square. Okay, and these all have height 1 fourth as well, because we start with a half multiplied by a half. And now finally, I'm going to add these up to get R of omega. And what happens? Well, most of these <laughs> places... Okay, and also you should imagine this omega sub C1 is sort of much bigger than the square. I know I drew them kind of overlapping, but there we go. Hopefully they're not overlapping now. Okay, so I'm going to, it's not exactly the scale because I don't have a lot of room here. But the point is, way over here at negative 2 omega C1, I'm going to have this term. Okay, these all have height 1 fourth. That's from right there. Over here. Oh, actually, sorry, I'm just adding these two signals. So yeah, it is very far out. That's good. Over here, 
have two omega sub C1. And I have this. Okay, but still, this would be much bigger than this because this is just like three times the baseband frequency, which is very small. This should be much bigger, but again, it's not exactly the scale. Okay, and then I'm going to add up everything sort of near the center. And right on the center, I'm going to get two times that triangle. They both are going to overlap perfectly. So this will have height one half. And then I'll have the other terms, the other stations on each side that have height one four. Okay, so this is R of omega. All right, so this is what happens after I receive the signal from the air and then I multiply it by this cosine, I'm gonna get the signal R of T, okay? And now how can we obtain from R of omega our original, where was it? Our original X1 of omega. We want that triangle right in the center and the baseband with height one. What do we have? Well, we have a whole bunch of junk, but then we have that triangle right in the center. This is negative omega sub M, omega sub M. We have that triangle right in the center, it just as height one half. So we should just multiply it by two and get rid of all the other stuff. So we're going to apply a low pass filter. This has been a common theme. We do this a lot, apparently. We did it in sampling as well. And what filter should we apply? Well, we definitely want to just extract out that triangle and get rid of all the other stuff. So it should go from negative omega sub m to omega sub m. What should the height be? Well, our height here is one half. We want it to be one. We'll just multiply it by two. Okay, so that is our low pass filter. And what do we get when we apply it to our R of omega signal? Well, it turns out, of course, we just get back X1 of omega. We get back exactly our triangle here with height one from negative omega sub m to omega sub m, right? Because this filter is going to zero out everything outside of that range. So all of this stuff will be gone. We're just left with this triangle of height one half multiplied by two. So we got our triangle of height one. Okay, so that's what that low pass filter is doing. And then of course, finally taking an inverse for a transform gives the signal we wanted, X one of T. Okay, so we can now send all these different signals through the air and it doesn't have to be just three, it could be as many as you want. Okay, and now we have a method of, first of all, taking our baseband signal and modulating it so that it's in the range that we're given as a radio station. And then once all the radio stations send their signals through the air, we have a way for the receiver to extract whichever one of those stations the receiver wants to listen to. Okay, so it's pretty cool. Let me just say in summary. Okay, so in summary, uh, to recover xi of t, Okay, so the i signal, we did all this for x1. All we have to do is compute r of t, which is z of t times cosine of omega sub c i of t, right? The carrier frequency of the station we want. And then we're going to apply the same low pass filter because you can try it <coughs> on your own, but it's the same process. The signal we want will appear right here in the perfect location for this filter to filter everything else out and just get that one signal that we want. Okay, so we just did it for a triangle, but you could try it for the circle or the square and you'll get the same thing. Or the same low pass filter will, will apply perfectly. Okay, so this is nice. So now on the receiver side, you only need to have one low pass filter, okay? And you just have to demodulate with a different frequency to get the different station that you want. Okay, great, so that's AM. And let me just summarize it all with kind of this block diagram. Okay, so what's happening is we have all these radio stations. So we have X1 of T and it's going to multiply the signal it wants to send by cosine of omega sub C1 of T. Okay, X2 of T, radio station two, is going to multiply the signal it wants to send by cosine of omega sub C2 of T. And X3 of T is going to multiply the signal it wants to send by cosine of omega sub C3 of T. Okay. So that's what all the stations are going to do. And then they're going to transmit them. I'll use this little symbol as sort of a transmit antenna. And they're all in the appropriate frequency ranges that they're allocated. Okay, and then we called all of those signals the Y sub I. So this is Y1 of T, Y2 of T, and Y3 of T. <coughs> those are the modulated signals. 
And then in the air, <laughs> they all get added up. It's like a big adder. And that produces the signal we call Z of T. Okay, this is our signal in the air. All right, and then what does it look like on the receiver side? Well, the receiver side to recover x sub i of t, what does that look like? Well, we're going to have an antenna that sort of gets the transmitted signal z of t from the air. So this is z of t that it receives. Okay, and then what we're going to do is multiply that by the cosine corresponding to the frequency, the carrier frequency of the station we want, omega sub ci, right? And then we're going to pass that through our LTI system that has that H of T impulse response. <clears throat> we drew H of omega, but of course we can write it H of T. I'm just keeping everything in time for this diagram. And what we get out is exactly the signal we want, XIFT. This is our baseband signal. Baseband signal for station pi. Okay, so there you go. So that's kind of in a block diagram, everything we did, the entire process. Um, and that's pretty much how AM radio works. So definitely go back through and make sure you understand, stood every step. Okay, make sure you understand, maybe try on your own, uh, drawing the pictures out for what it would be if we were trying to listen to radio station two say, and see actually how this entire process works in that case. We, we did this whole process for radio station one, the triangle. Maybe you're on your own, go back through and draw the pictures for how we would be able to listen to that circle station, station two. Okay, um, but yeah, so that's it. So this is kind of the whole thing summarized in one diagram. That's AM radio. And that's all I had for this video. I'll see you in the next one.